as I mentioned at the close of the last video, we're going to take a look at uh, some examples of numerology now uh, um, in the New Testament. It's also in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, I've done a lengthy discussion of this before um, where I go through how over and over again the Bible keeps using the same numbers in the same context, like the number 40, for example, you know, uh, the Israelites wandered supposedly for 40 years in the desert. Christ was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, it rained during Noah's flood for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, there are 12 apostles, 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, 12 tribes of Israel. You know, 12 is 12 that. The number 7 reoccurs under similar circumstances or having similar meanings. You know, it's all numerology, right? But let's look at some interesting New Testament examples here. Um a story of a miraculous catch of uh, a large number of fish wrought through the uh, risen Christ is found in John 21, verses 1 through 11. In this fish story, the disciples brought up 153 fish in their net. Uh, one would first have to wonder who actually undertook the effort of counting these fish and why, but nevertheless, uh, here is something far more disturbing. This number, 153, is taken from another ancient fish story, this time from uh, archaic Greek folklore. Interestingly enough, in this tale, Pythagoras, who created a secret society himself, didn't he? And we'll be talking about that down the line. Oh, uh -huh. will we ever? Pythagoras had some Sio influence going on. Yeah, and his secret society wasn't about math. That was the cover. It was a political subterfuge society. But anyway, in this tale, Pythagoras, a strict vegetarian, uh, bet some fishermen that if he could correctly guess the number of fish in their nets, they would let him go free. Of course, he got it right. There were, can you guess how many? 153, just like in the Jesus fish story from 500 years later. Oh, can anyone say plagiarism? But even more than that, can anyone say obvious secret society here? Christianity, just like the Pythagorean society? Of course. Look at how the same themes, numbers, symbols keep popping up over and over again. But anyway, get this. 153 was a sacred triangular number to the Pythagoreans. And here's Jesus performing this miracle of bringing up a great many fish. And it happens to be 153. You think that's a friggin' coincidence, really? And uh, again... Christ did this so-called miracle right after his resurrection. This was a sign, right? And what is the sign he gave them? A capture of 153 fish. It's like a little insider's joke. <laughs> you have to know the story of Pythagoras and how he was a member of a Zio secret society to really appreciate this. Just like when Jesus heals people and he spits on the ground, makes a ball of mud and rubs it on their eyes. Presto, you can see. Rubs it on their ears. Presto, you can hear. You'd have to be an insider and know that that was the way pagan faith healers of the day perform their so-called miracles. It's all little sleight-of-hand trickery games. But most people who aren't aware of that never catch on, and they fall for the baloney, the exoteric meaning that it's a miracle! The only miracle is how people can be so easily duped because they don't pay attention. In Mark 8, 19-21, we read, uh, Christ is speaking here, and he says, When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, you know, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, multiplying the fish and the bread, right? He's talking to his disciples here later on, and he says, When I broke these loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And then he went on to say, And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, another group that he allegedly miraculously fed, how many basketfuls of pieces uh, did you pick up? They answered, Seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Understand what? Well, plain as day. Jesus was simply drawing attention here to the numbers 12 and 7 because of their esoteric significance. That's it. The Bible doesn't give any explanation. It leaves you hanging, wondering, why would he say that? It must have some divine meaning. What is the deep spiritual implications of that? I'll tell you what the spiritual implications are. Dark occult. Uh secrecy. Numerology. The number 12 and the number 7. Those are two of the most important magical numbers in the entire Bible, right? 12 apostles, 12 foundation stones, you know, 12 uh, tribes, 7 candlesticks, 7 churches, 7 angels, you know, on and on and on. In the book of Revelation, right? The number 7 is particularly used extensively, profusely. Yahweh rested on the seventh day, the Shabbat. 
blessed it and made it holy. Jesus was drawing attention to these magical numbers. No explanation given. But you don't know, uh, you don't need to know the explanation. You don't need to be given the explanation. You can already know it. Once you, uh, you know, have figured out that this book is esotericism, right? Anyway, let's look at what Acts 19.12 says about the Apostle Paul. Um, even handkerchiefs and aprons that had been touched by him, Paul, were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Can you freaking believe this nonsense? What this is saying here is that people would take Paul's handkerchiefs and would go and touch someone who had an illness and they would be instantly healed. Or if they were demon-possessed, they would be touched with that handkerchief that Paul had touched and they'd be instantly healed. What kind of guff is that? Not only is this freaking witchcraft magic, right? But what kind of a god would only be interested in healing someone if they were lucky enough to be touched by a handkerchief that Paul touched and that would even respect something like this, that magical powers could be transferred to the handkerchief because Paul touched it? Doesn't that make Paul into an icon worthy of praise and honor? And No wonder the Catholic Church is so big on relics, right? Which Protestants look down at, but when you come right down to it, the Bible endorses those kind of practices. The magic scapular medal of Our Lady of Fatima. It worked a miracle just because I touched it, you know. Protestants mock at that, but they have no grounds to do it when they believe in the Bible. The Bible even says when Peter walked past someone, if his shadow was cast over them, they would be healed. Just if his shadow crossed over there. Get the hell out of here. But notice, though, the reference to handkerchief. That sounds pretty darn Masonic, doesn't it? Moreover, in Acts 21.16, we read, Some of the disciples from uh, Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of um, uh, Manasson. That's interesting. It's spelled M-N-A-S-O-N. -S uh, Mason. Uh, where we were to stay, he was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. Is Manasson a corruption of Mason or vice versa? But it gets stranger still. When Paul was brought before King Agrippa's court, look what Acts 26 verse 1 says he did. Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. Well, 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 well. He was in a courtroom. Before he gave his defense, it says, he motioned with his hand. The hell do you think that was put in there for? Did he give a Masonic hand signal to tip off the judge in hope of getting out of trouble, as is so often done in courtrooms by Masons today, giving the bear paw sign or the sign of a Mason in distress? So that a brother Mason who was obliged by his oath to make sure you get off scot-free because, ooh, you're a Mason? Anyway, we've been talking mostly about New Testament uh, connections with esotericism. What about the Old Testament? Can this be found in the old, this idea of esotericism be found there as well? Oh, absolutely. Albert Pike, a former 19th century 33rd degree uh, Freemason, in fact, he started the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasonry branch. Uh, here's what he wrote. Masonry is a search after light. Remember Christ's references to light, sons of light, let your light so shine. Uh, he talked about the whole body being full of light if your eye is single. That search, he says, leads directly back, as you see, to the Kabbalah. Well, yeah, but you can trace it back further than that right to the Bible, right? In that ancient and little understood philosophy, he said, the initiate will find the source of many doctrines. All of the Masonic associations owe to it their secrets and their symbols. Owe to what? The Kabbalah. The French Jewish paper, La Verite Israelite, Volume 5, page 74, admitted, quote, uh, The connections between Freemasonry and Judaism or Zionism are more intimate than one would imagine, of course. Judaism should maintain a lively and profound sympathy for Freemasonry in general and no indifference to it. No indifference to it. Anyway, he ends off by saying, and this is the crux of the whole matter, the spirit of Freemasonry is that of Judaism in its most fundamental beliefs. Its ideas are Judaic. Its language is Judaic. Freemasonry is Judaic. Its ideas. And what ideas does it have? Ultimately, Freemasonry, like all the other Judaic secret societies, is all about creating the new world order, right? Remember Daddy Bush and his thousand points of light speech? talking about the age-old dream a thousand generations have come and gone and have fought for this, and we now have it within our grasp when we are successful, and we will be. 
We will have a world much different from the one we've known. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll be much different, all right. If they have their way, it'll be from white to black, baby. Dark black. But notice, the ideas of Freemasonry are Judaic. Yeah, yeah, of course. But just how far back uh, do these connections go? Some would have us believe that they go back only as far as, uh, you know, 1717. Or some say, well, just to the Babylonian captivity in the late 7th century BC. Uh, but this isn't true either. The Masonic roots of Judaism, or the Judaic roots of Freemasonry, <laughs> however you want to look at it, go back to the earliest period of the history of this people, insofar as their history uh, in the Bible can be trusted. But, like I said, as fancified as the Bible is in its so-called historical uh, recollections, they are based, in some sense or other, on actual historical events, right? Which is what we will be looking at down the line. Um, you know, on my uh, True Threats channel, we're going to be looking at uh, the, uh, you know, the Hyksos domination of Egypt, and that's where this stuff can be traced back to its root. That's why Freemasonry traces its roots back uh, to Egypt once again. Anyway, when a Mason uh, is initiated into the third degree, a supposed reenactment of the murder of Hiram Abiff is played out, right? Abif was allegedly the uh, Masonic architect of Solomon's Temple. Although this person is not mentioned in the Old Testament, there are elements to this story that do have a basis in historical reality. But in reference to another person, in another place, and at another time, as we'll see. But anyway, in the Masonic story of Abif, three villains murdered him, and uh, they were identified as Jubela, Jubelo, and Jubalum. Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubilum. They all start with that prefix, Jew. <laughs> and um, they were known collectively as the Jewies, J-U-W-E-S, which is very interesting, isn't it? Because uh, that's the word that appeared on one of the uh, uh, 19th century um, Jack the Ripper killer's uh, notes that he left for police, right? He used that word. Jewish, clearly a Masonic killing, as I talked about in the previous video, right? Anyway, the um, actual murders, clearly, uh, the murderers, I should say, clearly were Jews, but the real story didn't involve Solomon's temple, and it didn't take place in Israel. Instead, it took place in Egypt, like so many other stories in the Bible, right? As we will see down the line, I am getting there eventually. I've got several other more things I want to cover. But when we get there, we're going to see that King Solomon, King David, uh, you know, Joseph, Moses, all of these personages did actually uh, exist, but not in the Levant. They existed in ancient Egypt. Their characters match up perfectly with Hyksosi and Egyptian pharaohs, as we will see later. And so it is with this story in the lore of Freemasonry. It talks about Solomon's temple, King Solomon, you know. But the actual personages that the stories go back to, which is why Masonry traces its roots back to Egypt. Don't think they don't know this. Of course they do. Of course they know these stories. These stories are just for the, the lower-level Masons, right? They're led to think they know the true meaning. They only find out the true meaning when they get to higher levels later on. But this fantasy story of Freemasonry did, did take place, but it took place in Egypt, the land where, again, Masonry traces its origins, right? And much of its symbolism, iconography, and rituals, on and on. Hyksosi in Egypt, of course. We're looking at a period in Egyptian history that was dominated by what I like to call the Proto-Hebrews, the, the Hyksos, uh, which were Semitics, right? They were Semites. Ancient Egypt had its share of um, esoteric teachings and practices, uh, as well as secret societies. I've kind of touched on this before in some previous videos, some of you may recall. Um... And, you know, the Hyksos left a profound influence on the Egyptians with this. After the Hyksos were expelled, a lot of the secret society stuff carried on. But I'll argue it carried on mostly because some Hyksos remained behind and kept the torch going, right? Uh, and that's how, even though they got expelled, they were able to regain power, you know, later on. And then they would get expelled again. 
But still, some remnants were left behind, as they've always done in the past. They would change their names, so they would mingle in, and nobody would know that they were actually Hyksos. They would weasel their way back into the king's court, and eventually, boom, they'd take control again. And if they couldn't do it themselves, through infiltration, if they got caught, they'd call upon, you know, the Nubians to assist them militarily. This went on again and again and again throughout Egyptian history. We're going to look at a lot of these, uh, a lot of examples of this. Most historians just refer to the Hyksos occupation that lasted roughly 100, 150, whatever years. Some say 200, but it's probably close to 100 years. They'll just refer to that particular time as though that's the only time the Hyksos dominated Egypt. Oh, no, 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 no. All throughout Egyptian history, sometimes a few centuries would go by, but they eventually would find their way back and play the same game with them again and again and again, as we will see. Oh, the havoc that they wreaked. Why Egypt so much? Oh, they infiltrated other nations too. But Egypt, at that time, was the dominant force in the world. It was an empire, right? Oh, they wanted their hands on that, baby. Anyway, let's look, for example, at the following excerpt from an inscription on a false door, now in the Cairo Museum, written by someone who uh, had been surprised and honored to be uh, admitted to the inner group or secret society of King Teti in ancient Egypt. Just to show you that they did, in fact, have a secret society in ancient Egypt, right? which the Hyksos had created. This inscription reads, Today in the presence of the son of Ra, uh, Teti, living forever, high priest of Tar, um, more honored by the king than any servant as master of secret things of every work which his majesty uh, should be done. Secret work that should be accomplished in conjunction with his majesty, right? This is clearly referring to a Masonic advisor to the king who advises the king about secret things which need to be done so we can take advantage of the Egyptians, screw them over, and walk away with all of their wealth in our pockets. That's what really what this is saying, right? This is what all secret societies have been about. All of them! They have always been cloaks for political subterfuge. Oh, they'll claim they're all about, you know, uh, advancing you uh, spiritually, raising you to new heights on a spiritual level, blah, blah, blah. We'll teach you uh, ancient esoteric, uh, esoteric secrets, uh, uh, you know, to uh, heighten your soul, and, you know, that's what religions teach, too, right? Religions teach the same thing, don't they? We're going to save your soul. We're going to lead you to nirvana, to glory land, to heaven, whatever name they put on it. They all make the same grand those promises. But then at the end of the day, you find out all that's happening, in spite of all the, the, the hype and the, uh, the excitement they fill you with about hope for everlasting life, at the end of the day, your pockets are empty. The minister or swami or whatever the hell name he goes by uh, walks away with big, fat, bulgy pockets with your cash, and you're left out in the cold. But you're patted on the back and ensured that, oh, trust in the Lord, he'll work it out. He promised to give you blessings, and since you've been so faithful in paying your tithes and offerings or whatever, he's going to reward you, and of course the reward never comes. Who gets the reward? The one who conned you into giving you, uh, giving him your, your, your money. All religions do it, folks, and it turns out that today, and for a very long time now, all religions have been run by the same people. You know, the ones that run the world's governments and the media and the education system and the multinational corporations and the big banks, the big investment firms, you know, the people I'm talking about? Yeah, them. And they've accomplished all of this hijacking through secret societies like Freemasonry. Anyway, this quote goes on, this ancient Egyptian quote here. Pleasing the heart of his lord every day. The Masonic infiltrator pleasing the heart of his lord, his king, right? With his wisdom on how to rip off his own people. Yes, that's very pleasing to the king. High priest of Ta, Sabu. High priest of Ta, cupbearer uh, of the king, master of secret things of the king in his every place. Again, here's your esotericism, right? Master of secret things. Isn't that what Jesus was? A master of secret things? He said it himself, right? He called himself master. He had everybody else call him master or Raboni. And he talked about how uh, his teachings were secret, intended only for the advanced uh, members of his inner circle, right? And for everyone else, I just feed them pablum parables, so that seeing they see not, hearing they hear not. It's the same crap, guys. Different name, different place, different date, but same game. And same tribe playing it. The quote goes on. When his majesty favored me, his majesty uh, caused that I enter into the privy chamber. Why did the master favor him, the king? Because he gave, let him in on all these secrets and how to rip the Egyptians off to make him wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. Why should I serve these people? and do what's in their interest when I can lie to them and tell them I'm serving them when I'm actually screwing them over. You sure this will work? Oh, yes, Master. Yes, King. Of course. We've done it before. This formula is full 
world. The people look up to you. They respect you. You can take advantage of that. Why should you settle for sharing your wealth with them? It's yours, O king. Everything. This whole land is yours. These people are yours. Take advantage of them. You have the opportunity at your grasp. You think you're a great man now? Think of the unfathomable wealth that you can uh, line your pockets with. That's what this is talking about. His majesty favored me. His majesty caused that I enter into the privy chamber. Yes, let me in your privy chamber. It'll just be between the two of us. We'll keep this absolutely secret. We don't want anyone to know, because if they find out, they'll have both our heads. But here's how we're going to do it. We're going to lie to them while we're screwing them. We're going to tell them this is in their interest. They'll believe it because you're the divinely appointed king. Ra guides you on their behalf, right? Divine right of kings. Sound familiar? Or mandate of heaven, as they called it in China? Do you see this game? How it's been played out. Oh, if you don't see it yet, don't worry. Don't worry, because we're going to get to that. One nation at a time. We're going to go through China, ancient Greece, of course, ancient Egypt, and a great many other ancient nations. We're going to show how they played this game again and again by introducing this idea of the divine right of kings. Getting the people to trust the king as much as they trusted their god because their king was being divinely appointed. Have we already seen that in the pages of the New Testament? Where Paul talked about obeying the authority that God has put there, and if you don't obey the authority, you're not obeying God? And at the same time, Paul was encouraging them to obey those who had the rule over them in the Lord, too. Obey the government, yes, but also obey your religious masters. Paul really didn't want them to obey the government, though. He had to say that initially so that the Romans would, you know, wouldn't intercept his letters and come after him. But initially, he wanted them to obey, too, right? He wanted to be an all to whip them into submission, to think all authority needed to be obeyed. But in time, his aim was to show them, hey, you know, I know what I told you before about obeying God, but God has revealed to me now that the king actually, or the, the Caesar, the, you know, the emperor, he's not obeying God anymore. He, he's against God. Look how evil he is. Look what he's doing. You know, blah, 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 blah. Paul knew that later they could be trusted to turn on the king once he consolidated their uh, trust in him as the ultimate authority, right? Because he spoke for God directly. He received visions. Do you see how religion itself is and never has been yet another Zio created secret society? Even the non-Abrahamic folks, to a large degree, down through the centuries, it, it, though not created by them, were infiltrated and used by them to that very end, that same exact end. So if you wouldn't join one of their, uh, you know, more secular secret societies like the Pythagoreans, if you wouldn't join one of their occult secret societies, if that didn't appeal to you, well, they would just have you join one of the more accepted cults that was already in place before they came along that most people already looked up to and trusted, right? They would infiltrate them, just like they've done today, right? Most church leaders today are freaking Freemasons. They infiltrated them, not that they did to, because they're already corrupt anyway, but uh, to make sure they had control, because there's still a danger of independent thinkers out there, right? Ministers that aren't on board, just like that threat had existed in Congress before. Not so much anymore. But in the past, you know, we had some honest people in Congress who were trying to make a difference, and they became a real problem. If they became too much of a problem, well, they, you know, induct them into the involuntary suicide program or something, right? But today, they really don't have to do that anymore because they're all totally in bed with them. Every freaking one of them. Took them a while to get to that point, but they've done it. They've done it. Your, your politicians are all sellouts. Even some of the ones that seem to be on your side. You start looking at them more closely and you realize, wow, they're full of crap too. Sure, they said some things I liked, but that was part of the deception, right? False and controlled opposition. A lot of people looked up to Ron Paul and his son Rand Paul, right? And they loved it when he was raking over the coals, or seemingly raking over the coals, uh, Mr. Uh, Anthony Fauci, right? Drilling him about gain-of-function research. It all looked really good, just like a professional wrestling match, right? For those that don't know better, they watch that, and they really think that these guys are going at it, by slamming each other, not realizing, though, that after the match, they're all at the corner bar laughing it off. They're all buddies. It's all a freaking show, right? Well, so it was with Mr. Rand Paul. Sorry, but he's one of them. He's not on your side, folks. So many, quote, truthers, we're singing the praise of this guy, thinking that, oh, what a hero, look at he's really going after him. Yeah, the gain of function thing. It was all staged. Later, when it came out that he did, in fact, lie and was in contempt of Congress, that he did, in fact, fund gain of function research, his own institution admitted it, right? Did Mr. Rand Paul go after him? Of course not. It was just window dressing, just a stage show for public theater. That's it. Hey, to tell you guys, but that's the case across the board. Our politicians are and have been for quite some time now, absolute sellouts, and it doesn't freaking matter if they're Republicans, Democrats, the whole system is rotten through and freaking through. But anyway, let me get back to this quote. This is really important here. When His Majesty favored me, His Majesty caused that I enter into the privy chamber, as I said. 
Then I might set for him the people into every place. I might set for him the people into every place. In other words, I'm going to set it up for him so the people become completely controlled and mesmerized and like robots follow orders, not even realizing that these orders are against their own interests. They'll think that it's something good. I'm going to wow the king with my ability to do this because me and my tribe have had a long history of doing this, even at this time. Anyway, where I found the way, he said, to manipulate the people and bring them into every place where I found the way. In other words, I had to tailor the propaganda for different ones because some were more alert than others, some were more suspicious than others. So I would tailor the propaganda, just like today, right? They tailor the propaganda. For those who are a little bit more awake than the average person, they introduced Mr. Rand Paul and even staged that little thing before Congress. Uh, you know, you funded data function research. Sounded really good. Wow, he's our hero. But all the while, they're both reading off a pre-written script. The quote continues, Never was alone uh, the like to any servant like me by my sovereign. Now, this is the Hyksosian uh, advisor bragging about himself. Never was alone the like to any servant like me. In other words, there's been no servant like me who had this great wisdom to know how to manipulate the masses on your behalf, O king. It really wasn't for the, well, it was for the king because he was a Hyksos too, most likely. Um, I'm not even sure which king this particular quote is, is referring to, so he might not have been. Certainly, though, this advisor was a Hyksos. Um, but nevertheless, there's been no servant like unto me able to manipulate the, the way I am, I'm doing, right? By any sovereign, because his majesty loved me more than any servant of his. Right. This sounds like Joseph, right? Joseph was the second highest in command in Egypt, says the Bible. Well, there were two figures that meet the Joseph uh, description, and we'll be looking at that later, too. Uh, take your pick. Could be either one of them. But maybe Joseph is a character based on both of them. Who knows? But in any case, yeah, these were both characters that manipulated the Egyptian pharaohs. To, uh, 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 manipulated the Egyptian people with help from the pharaoh, you know, to rape and pillage the entire country, line their pockets, the, the, the king's pockets, as well as the advisor's pockets. Because I was honored in his heart, it says. I was useful in his majesty's presence. I found a way in every secret matter of the court. I was honored in his majesty's presence in every secret matter of the court. Yeah. This is how they took down Rome, guys, right? Took them a while, but they did. Josephus was taken back to the Roman court, and he became privy to all the secrets of the empire. And he shared it with his brothers, his brother tribesmen, who were working in other local king's courts, right? And they would conspire, pin them against each other. Oh, I, I, the, the deception, it's unbelievable. They're, they're so calculating, so far-reaching in their planning. And the masses have yet to realize this. If only real history were taught. You see why they had to hijack education. You couldn't have local towns teaching future generations anymore, right? Because that was too risky. There could be many individual teachers out there who know the story and are actually teaching kids. No, 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 no. Can't have that. As they knew we were going to be getting closer to their goal of world government. Back in the 60s, they had their Sephardic buddy, LBJ, introduce national education laws, right? And the first thing they did is shut down all the small local community schools and consolidated them into one centralized school now. A centralized high school, a centralized middle school, a centralized grammar school, you know, elementary school, and have the kids bust. And that's no problem. We'll just raise taxes so everybody, uh, you know, so we can pay for this. We'll pick everybody's pockets on the local, state, and federal level. All to ensure that Every student would be on the same page now, and they all would be fed the same BS propaganda. And to ensure that they would not be fed any truth. The history books were to be completely revamped, and the teachers were to be trained to teach according to the textbook. And in the, the past few decades, to ensure that, they introduced this lesson plan BS that teachers got to write up for every freaking class they teach, to take up any spare time they have to make sure they're not doing any outside research to bring extra curricular uh, uh, information, you know, into the classroom. They don't want it. In fact, it's not allowed. Teachers can actually get in trouble with the school for doing that. You are to teach only because the standardized tests are just based on what's, you know, the crap that's in the textbook, right? So that's all you're to teach as a teacher. The dumbed down, doped up, watered down, milk toast crap in the textbooks. This is what went on in ancient Egypt and every other nation these people have gone, folks. This is all they've ever done. Deceive uh, con people, 
hijack the government, if the government even needed to be hijacked. In the case of the Hicks laws, no, there was no hijacking. But when they did hijack, they would deceive the king as much as the, the, the people that were being deceived under them, right? They would fool the king into thinking that this is about all about you, O king. They did it when they funded Alexander the Great, right? They convinced him that they were helping him. They wanted to see the world ruled by Alexander the Great. They thought he was a great man. They pumped him up, pumped up his ego with the things he wanted to hear, right? And then once he conquered the world, then they stepped forward and said, Oh, I guess we forgot to tell you, but we funded you because you were conquering the world for us. And when he realized that and didn't like it, well, he died from a drunken spree, right? <laughs> That's what they said Jimi Hendrix died from. They said they found his stomach loaded with wine. But what most people don't realize is Jimi Hendrix didn't like wine. So how do you suppose that wine got in him? Can you say wine boarding, perhaps, instead of waterboarding? Anyway, this is the game, guys. This is the game they've always played. And I do hope you know that most musicians, pretty much all of them, uh, who have died at very young ages, uh, those were no accidents or suicides. Or uh, No, you can throw that out the window. I'll do a series on that sometime, going through some of the, uh, the, the big names. I've got quite a few sets of notes on, uh, you name it, John Denver, uh, Janis Joplin, uh, on and on it goes. None of these things were overdose. Or, or about Marilyn Monroe, there's a good one. Uh, Mary Pinkett Meyer. The list goes on and on. None of these people died from, you know, overdoses or, or, or uh, well, in some cases they may have been overdoses, but they weren't willful over, uh, overdoses. No, not at all. There's even a thing called the 27 Club. For those that aren't familiar with that, look, look that up. I'll do a presentation on that as well sometime. But uh, there's this thing where a great many uh, celebrities have died under mysterious circumstances at the age of 27. That has occultic overtones to it, which I'll get into later, but let me just say this for now. The number 27 is actually synonymous in the occult world with the number 33, because 27 can be written as 3 to the third power, i.e. 33, right? Anyway. But notice how uh, the individual speaking in this ancient Egyptian quote said that he had found the way isn't that interesting, the way? Because, if you will recall, in the book of Acts, the early Christians referred to their religious movement as the way. Christ said that I am the way, the truth and the life, right? The Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls referred to themselves as the way. <laughs> we're already seeing some interesting connections here, aren't we? Oh, we're going to get into a hell of a lot more later on. But already, look at this. But please notice also how this individual in this last ancient Egyptian quote was made to enter into the privy chamber of the king. Again, obviously, a Hyksos Semite who made his way into a high position in Egypt, just like we have with the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, right? The second in command, the right-hand man of the king. In fact, he really was uh, the top man on campus because the king was following his advice, right? So even though on paper he was the second in command, really the way that the story is uh, laid out for us, and the way that ancient Egyptian documents confirm, uh, they were Hyksosian advisors who actually did serve the role, the leading role as rulers of Egypt, even though on paper, again, the king was the, the top man, right? Kind of sounds, sounds like how our system works today, where you vote this Muppet or that Muppet into the Oval Office, but then upon closer inspection, as sleazy as they are, they're actually not calling the shots. Oh, they sign their name with the pen, but it's somebody else's shots that are being called. They're just putting their name on it. Anyway. Um, but you, you can't fail to take notice the interconnectedness between, you know, the modus operandi of the Hyksos and then the later modus operandi of the Essenes, the Christians, the Masons, the Pythagoreans, you start looking at the big picture and you realize, son of a gun, it's the same game plan, the same tactics, and yes, behind the curtain, the same people. Paul really laid out uh, the uh, the modus operandi here in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. Listen to what he wrote. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To what? To his secret society called Christianity. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, 
I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. You see what he's saying here? He played the phony, the trickster. Paul said, crafty man that I am, I fooled you by trickery, right? Well, here's an example of the kind of trickery that he engaged in. He pretended, he's telling you right here in his own words, he pretended to be a Jew among the Jews and a Greek among the Greeks, a Gentile among the, you know, the Gentiles, right? He pretended. Well, the truth is, he really was a Jew. He wasn't pretending. But nevertheless, he said to the Jews, the Jewish leaders, whatever they wanted to hear to lure them in to his version of Judaism, right? Which was insurrectionism, like militant Moses. So it wasn't really his version, although, you know, he mixed the Jesus stuff in there with it, um, which they didn't like. But he knew that the Jesus method worked with the Gentiles so well, so this is the way we've got to go. And it is the way they wound up going, isn't it? Pagan Rome became Papal Rome. They did take over uh, pagan Rome, but they did it through the branch of Christianity known as Roman Catholicism. That's how they ruled all of Europe. Even the kings were subject to the power of the church, right? The kingly line, subordinate to the priestly line. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, even though I myself am not under the law. You see what he's saying? I pretended I was under the law, even though I'm not. He's saying he's lying. Oh, what a great example that sets. Yes, Paul was such an honest man, above the above board, right? Christian dupes. To those not having the law, meaning Gentiles, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. In other words, he was saying he became a Jew among the Jew, a Greek among the Greeks, a Gentile among the Gentile. He became whatever his surroundings were, which is why one minute he's telling the Galatians that these Judaizers in Jerusalem who are still practicing circumcision are voiding the cross of Christ. And yet... When he went to Jerusalem, like we see in the book of Acts, after his conversion, so-called, he goes into the temple to participate in circumcision rites. He circumcised Timothy, didn't he? You know he did, Bible dopes. You know he did. You know this is blatant in-your-face hypocrisy. Paul was a fraud. He engaged in outright friggin' trickery by his own admission. He was proud of it. Crafty man that I am. Look how I fooled you with my trickery. Paul was following the footsteps of the Hyksos, wasn't he? In the footsteps of militant Moses, wasn't he? In the footsteps of uh, Freemasonry. Or its earlier form, known as the Essenes, and of course, their branch over in Egypt, the Therapeutia, following in the exact same footsteps. The footsteps of the Pythagoreans, right? So as to win those not having the law, Paul would become one, you know, with the Gentiles who didn't have the law, right? He became like one of them so he could win them over. Win them over to what? To his frickin' insurrectionist cause. His power-grabbing cause. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people. So that by all possible means, I might save some. Oh yeah, yeah that's the rhetoric Christian leaders use today, right? It's all about saving souls. So go door to door and petition people to give money. It's all about saving souls. It's about lining your pockets, you lying fraud artists and recruiting new suckers to manipulate and exploit. But nevertheless, guys, look how he says here that I have become all things to all men. I'm playing the cloak and dagger game. I'm fooling them by putting on a fake disguise and pretending to be something I'm not to lure them in. This is exactly what he's saying. I'm not twisting his words. I'm not putting any meaning in his mouth that he isn't giving, it, uh, giving to these words himself. Look it up and read it for yourself. Pick any translation of your choice. It doesn't matter. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Read it. Read it and see. I'm not, uh, I'm elaborating on it, but I'm not giving it a meaning. He's not giving himself. He's admitting here, this is his tactic, and this has been the Zio tactic all along, hasn't it? How do you think they suckered so many people into believing in the COVID frickin' crap by hearing it day in and day out constantly on the radio, on the TV? You couldn't turn the TV on or the radio on uh, all during COVID without hearing this crap constantly drilled into your head. Oh my God, it's deadly. It's spreading everywhere. For a whole year, almost a whole year. People were pumped with that, right? So that by the time the savior vaccine came along, most people couldn't get to the clinic fast enough because they were told, this is the only hope of our COVID salvation. You must repent of your skepticism and blindly follow what you're told. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Right? Right? And if you don't do whatever we command you, why, you're an insurrectionist. Well, in that context... Insurrectionism would have been a good thing now, wouldn't it? But not in first century Judea, when they had no reason to rise up. They wanted to rise up for one reason and one reason only. 
to gain power. Remember the Monty Python movie? Oh, I love that movie, Life of Brian, man. So many digs against the Zio scum. If you haven't seen that, you really got to watch it in the context of Jesus having been an insurrectionist. They knew. They understood the whole game. They knew what it was all about. I love this one scene. They're all sitting around the table. We're going to get the Romans. Overthrow them. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, one of them's like, well, well wait a minute. Uh, didn't they bring us the aqueducts? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, they did bring us the aqueducts. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to get the Romans. Yeah, let's get the Romans. They're all cheering. Well, wait, what? What about the roads? D didn't they build the roads for us, too? Oh, well, well yeah, yeah, they did build the roads. But we're going to get the Romans. <laughs> He kept going through a whole list of stuff like that, right? And showing that you don't have a damn reason for rising up against the Romans. They've licked your hind pots. they built your frickin' temple for you with Roman taxpayers' money, right? And yet they rose up. I'm all for rising up against the corrupt government, guys. But when these scoundrels do it, they're doing it in times of peace when they're living quite prosperous lives. Look what they're doing now. They're taking this whole system down, aren't they? When we sat back and allowed them to hoard all kinds of wealth in their hands, our wealth, and in thankfulness to us now, they're kicking the ladder out, aren't they? They're taking the whole damn system down. A system they set up to take down, right? Set up the pins so you can knock them down. Set up the dominoes so you can knock them down. Every time they have staged a revolution, a civil war, oh hell, they've staged them all, haven't they? But every time, every time, it's never about overthrowing an oppressive government. That's what they've always claimed that they were doing. But as soon as the government was toppled and they stepped forward to assume power like they did in frickin' Russia in 1917, the system they introduced was itself outrageously oppressive, downright murderous, wasn't it? But they sold it to the masses as liberation from an oppressive government. And so it was, guys, in the first century with the insurrectionist movement. There was no need for them to rise up. Rome was bending over backwards for them. They simply wanted Rome out because A, they're unclean Gentiles walking on our holy soil, and B, we want to rule the world, not them. No, that's not justification for insurrectionism. Sorry. Sorry. What is justification for insurrectionism is when these scumbags are calling the shots, screwing everybody else over while they amass all power and wealth in their hands like what we're living under right now. That's grounds for insurrectionism. Yeah, it is. So Paul says, To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Oh, yes, out of the goodness of his heart, Paul was... This is the end justifies the means, right? He no sooner gets done saying that he's lying to people and pretending to be something he isn't, but... but Christians would say, well, yes, yes, but, but, he was justified because he did it so that he could save souls. Oh, shut up, that's not why he did it. What do you mean, save souls? Save them from what? You think Paul believed in the gospel any more than I do? <laughs> he knew it was a scam, but he also knew that it was a great way to hijack people's minds, a great system of mind control, to pick their pockets and exploit them any old way he so chose. But this is the end justifies the means concept, which... Ignatius Loyola later employed, right? Through his Jesuit order. This is what Paul is saying. I have become all things to all men. That by all possible means I might save some. Yeah, right. He threw that in there so it would look good, right? So he wouldn't be condemned for playing his little cloak and dagger game. I'm just doing it to save souls. The end justifies the means. Your means suck. And you know what? Your end sucks too. It has nothing to do with saving souls, you lying fraud. Your whole religion is a scam. No, all you're interested in is power for your little Zio tribe. And money. Can't have one without the other. Paul ended off by saying, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. <laughs> well, there he was being honest, right? Oh, yeah. He did it so he could share in its blessings. And oh, what blessings they were! Don't forget, Paul says, us who work in the gospel, we deserve twice the honor or twice the wages of an average worker, they're not working for God like me and my compadres. We're worth twice the honor. So that's what he meant when he said, so that I might share in its blessings. Unfriggin' real, man. What a scoundrel. But was Paul a member, in fact, a leader of a secret society? Oh, he was the leader in his day, wasn't he? He picked up where Jesus left off and took it to new heights that Jesus didn't even anticipate. Christ never intended to incorporate Gentiles in this movement, right? Paul realized, wow, we can really... And so he gave the impression later that, oh yeah, Jesus was all for this idea. No, he wasn't. Christ didn't even so much as hint at such an idea. Peter never picked up on it. Because Christ never taught it, that's why. 
Peter had no idea that Gentiles were supposed to be accepted like Jews were, which is why he said in the book of Acts, you know full well that according to our law, it is not permitted for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, which is why he wouldn't sit and have lunch with them, right? Yeah, Christ taught that, all right. Anyway, but guys, are you starting to see the connections? We're going to look at more later. It's going to become even more clear in future presentations, but I hope already you're starting to see the common thread that runs through here. We're going to talk about Machiavelli later. We're going to talk about Sun Tzu. Oh, we're going to see the connections there, not only uh, because of the similarity in philosophy, right? But we're actually going to see tribal Zio fingerprints all over those characters. So you will be left with no doubt that those toxic political philosophies came from the same freaking source. I'm going to do a whole, do a whole series on China. Oh, we're going to talk about the China. And now Freemasonry was very big. It's each of the China, believe it or not. Oh, very big. Yeah, they played their game over there, too. Oh, did they ever. I'm not making fun of the Chinese accent. I actually like the Chinese accent. Sometimes I'll, uh, you know, I'll do a southern accent. Joe, I like the southern accent. I'm, I'm not making fun of it. I, I really do like the southern accent. But sometimes, you know, I'll talk like a dumb arse with a southern accent. And it's, some southerners that listen to me have gotten offended. No offense, uh, it, it, you know, implied. Uh, anyway, anyway. So... What we um, see here, though, again, i got to emphasize the point. This is the philosophy of the end justifies the means. Paul didn't put it in those words, but he didn't have to, did he? It's clear uh, what he meant when he said, I become all things to all men, that I might save souls. And so by saying save souls, this is your justification, right? The end justifies the means. What a fraud. Anyway, guys, we already reached the hour mark again, so uh, I'm going to stop there. But... Uh, Oh, lots more to come. This is going to get really, really interesting uh, as we continue on here. So, again, thanks for joining me, guys. Catch you in the next video. Take care.